At Siavulo, we fundamentally believe that whatever we are designing, building, creating, whether it is an online resource, a textbook, a new feature of software, a training workshop, we need to start at the foundations of how we learn. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the relevant research and guiding principles that we have used and continue to use as we build and support intelligent practice, our online adaptive practice service for high school mathematics and science. Much has happened in the last 100 years as the field of cognitive science has blossomed. This is very exciting as what we now have is the makings of research-based theory of how people learn that applies to the educational context, that is the science of learning, and guiding principles into how to help people learn the science of instruction. Firstly, let's consider what we mean by learning. Learning is a process, it is not a product. Learning involves change, and this change happens over time. Lastly, learning is a result of how someone interprets and responds to experiences. Learning is not something done to students. They need to be active participants in their learning process, and we need to enable them to be. There are many, many approaches to learning. Central to our approach at Siavula is the idea of mastery-based learning. What do we mean by this? Well, let's look at the key elements of mastery which apply to any field or discipline. Starting at the basics, one needs to first acquire the component skills. But acquiring these component skills in isolation does not help with more complex tasks. This is why you need to then practice integrating those skills. Furthermore, one then needs to know when and where to use these skills. We want learners to be able to apply the skills they learn in one context to a new context. Only when these three elements have been achieved do we achieve real mastery of the concepts learned. And, as we've said, this is a continuous process. There is no upper bound in our learning. We can continually transfer skills to further and more dissimilar contexts in our learning. When learning a concept, topic or field of expertise, we progress through various stages in the development of mastery. Before starting to learn something, you do not know what you do not know. You are unconsciously incompetent. As soon as you start to learn something, you become aware of what you do not know. You are consciously incompetent. Over time, you start to master skills and concepts and you become aware of your competency in the field until eventually you are at a stage where your competency and mastery of the subject is unconscious. You are unconsciously competent. We'll come back to these stages in the context of practicing and using intelligent practice. Here we have the learning pyramid based on research into the effectiveness of different instructional strategies. According to this pyramid, you will only retain about 20% of what I'm saying in this video. We need to question the traditional lecturing model, particularly in STEM-related fields. As we can see, a constructivist approach of learning by doing or active learning has a much greater impact on performance as opposed to passively listening. Practicing is the piece we are focused on at Siavula, but not just any practice, we want it to be intelligent and effective so that learners are practicing smarter and not harder. So again, we look to the research as to what types of practice enhance mastery learning. Firstly, there is strong evidence to support that for practice or mastery to be effective, it needs to be goal-directed. Consider someone learning to play the piano. Studies looking at the best players and most effective learners have identified that the top strategies they employ are to do with how they practice. Top pianists also make mistakes when learning a new piece, but what predominantly sets them apart is their goal to firstly identify the source of their error and then target their practice on the weak area until they have mastered it before moving on and playing the piece within the context of the whole. Goal-directed behavior needs to be coupled with targeted practice and furthermore immediate feedback. And the more often and targeted the feedback is, the better. This is especially true during the early stages of mastery development. 
To ensure that learning through practice has a significant effect on learning, the practice needs to be at the appropriate level of challenge. This is neither too difficult, otherwise learners struggle too much, become frustrated, confused, and possibly give up, nor too easy, otherwise learners become bored and are not pushed to improve. This is called your zone of optimal cognitive load and is dependent on the individual. Doing a task that is at the right level of challenge for a person's level of knowledge or skill is one of the key predictors for flow, the state of mind where you are most happy, engaged and motivated. We want our learners to be motivated to continue practicing and learning. Therefore, behind intelligent practice is a machine learning engine adapting each practice session. The goal of the algorithm is to maintain an optimal cognitive load so that learners on average get exercises right 70% of the time. Weaker learners are therefore not discouraged and stronger learners are still encouraged to improve. We want learners to not only master maths and science, but to really enjoy doing it. In addition to identifying practice that is goal directed and at the appropriate difficulty level, we also need a sufficient quantity of practice for the benefits to accumulate over time. If we first consider the forgetting curve, research has shown that when you first learn something new, you are likely to forget it very quickly. If, however, you revise that topic after a few days, the rate at which you forget it is much slower. The more often you revise and reinforce what you have learned, the better it sticks in your memory. Learners often underestimate the need for continuous revision and spending time on the task. This graph clearly shows the need for regular revision and practice throughout the year. This also requires access to a large amount of practice so that these benefits can accumulate over time. If learners therefore recap and practice their work regularly throughout the year, when it comes to exams, it will be much easier for them to recall what they have learned. And so we therefore recommend the regular use of intelligent practice throughout the year. Next, consider this graph. What this shows is that although the benefits of practice accumulate over time, they do so at unequal rates. This is something useful to be aware of during learning, both for teachers and especially learners. Now I'm also going to plot the stages of mastery development that we saw earlier. Before a learner starts practicing, they are unconsciously incompetent, as they do not yet know what they do not know. During the early stages of practice, learners advance to a state of conscious incompetence, they will make mistakes and have to spend a significant amount of time practicing without seeing a correlated significant change in your mastery or performance. This is quite a challenging stage for learners to push through, but important to recognize that it is a normal part of the learning process. As learners practice more and start to grasp concepts and skills, they see a more rapid increase in their progress and mastery. They become conscious of their competence improving. However, learners still have to think and act deliberately when solving problems. Finally, during the later stages of practicing, your measurable improvement in mastery seems to slow down again as you see the orange line plateau. Learners also find this stage challenging to stay motivated and underestimate the need to continue practicing. The benefit here of continuously practicing and revising even once you feel you have mastered a topic, is that you move into a stage of unconscious competence. Skills and concepts are solidified in your long-term memory and become automatic. The last piece about the type of practice we want learners to be doing is explained clearly in an experiment done in 2007, contrasting blocked practice, which is the more traditional technique of drilling, with interleaved or mixed practice. There have been several conclusive studies in the past 30 years using different scenarios and contexts, but I'm going to use this particular experiment to convey the idea. It involved teaching college students how to calculate the volumes of four geometric shapes. Students were split into two groups, the mixers doing interleaved practice and the blockers doing blocked practice. The mixers were given all four tutorials for the four different shapes and then completed four problem sets that mixed up the different shapes. Conversely, 
The blockers were given one tutorial and then four related practice problems before moving on to the next three types in a similar manner. Let's look at the results of the experiment. During the practice sessions, students doing blocked practice significantly outperformed those that did interleaved practice. This is often how textbooks and worksheets are laid out, where you draw one specific concept or skill at a time. The problem is, it leads to a false sense of accomplishment during a practice session. How do we know this? Well, one week later, when these students wrote a test, what do you think happened? As you can see, those that did interleaved practice significantly outperformed those that did blocked practice. As we've seen, the evidence for interleaved practice is very compelling, but how does it work? There are two central hypotheses. In order to practice a skill, the brain needs to bring that piece of knowledge into working memory. With blocked practice, this happens for the first practice problem and then does not happen again during the session. With interleaved practice, the brain needs to bring the relevant knowledge into working memory each time strengthening the pathways for those memories over time. We say you are breaking in a path where blocked practice is like walking across the lawn once, but interleaved practice involves walking back and forth across the lawn many times so that a path develops, which you can still find in a couple weeks or months time. The second theory is that working on similar skills at the same time forces the brain to discriminate between those two skills and figure out which skill applies to which problem. This forces the brain to focus more intensely and may lead to better retention. Think of driving a car down a highway. Blocked practice is like setting cruise control and zoning out, with no memory of the trip when we reach our destination. Interleaved practice is much more like stop and grow traffic, where it's impossible to zone out as you keep on having to consider and adjust your driving. The sequencing algorithm behind intelligent practice, therefore, also ensures a practice session is interleaved so that learners work on more than one skill in parallel. So in summary, research, theory and experience have shown us that to facilitate the most effective learning, practice for mastery needs to be goal-directed, coupled with feedback that is immediate and targeted, Practice needs to be targeted at an appropriate level of difficulty for each individual so that learners remain in the zone of optimal cognitive load. Learners need a sufficient quantity of regular practice for the benefits to accumulate over time. And lastly, practice needs to be sequenced appropriately, drawing on the benefits of interleaving whilst looking at the dependencies between concepts and skills as we construct a learning path to build on prior knowledge. Achieving all of this for every individual during every practice session is almost impossible, even for the most dedicated teacher. This is where we see the potential in technology and data analysis to really make a difference to the learning and teaching experience. And so we built a tool that brings all of this together, enabling and motivating each individual to master maths and science. The intelligence runs deep right down to the underlying engine that is adaptive and learns making sure each learner practices at the appropriate level of difficulty and gets the feedback they need for long-term growth and progress. This is intelligent practice.